your all holiness, your graces, lords and excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Five years ago, Pope Benedict XVI visited St. Mary's University as part of his historic state visit to the United Kingdom. Whilst here, he stressed that ever since the Second Vatican Council, the Catholic Church has placed particular emphasis on the importance of dialogue and cooperation between people of faith. It is therefore appropriate and fitting that we celebrate that event five years later with your historic visit and address to us today. As Archbishop of Constantinople, you are recognised as occupying the first throne of the worldwide Orthodox Christian Church and as such have the title of First Among Equals amongst the Orthodox Primates. Your personal experience and theological perspective uniquely equip you to talk on ecumenical relations and environmental issues and we are eagerly anticipating your lecture today. Like the current Pope Francis, your All Holiness's untiring work for reconciliation between humanity and the cosmos through growing ecological awareness has gained you an international reputation as a prophet for a world currently on the verge of ecological disaster. Like Pope Francis, you recognise the need for peace amongst people of religion if a true witness to the resurrection is to be made in our troubled times. To this end, your pilgrimage to this land is especially valued and appreciated today, not least by Cardinal Vincent Nichols, who sends his warmest greetings and blessings today. As a citizen of Turkey, presently adjoining the travails of the Middle East, you are again in a unique position to recognise how the healing love of the risen Christ can speak to a divided world. And as well as being invited to address the European Parliament, UNESCO, the World Economic Forum and numerous national parliaments, you have organised eight international, interfaith and interdisciplinary symposia, as well as numerous seminars and summits to address ecological problems in the rivers and seas of the world. All this has earned you the popular title of the Green Patriarch. Your All Holiness, Pope Benedict, during his visit here, talked of an ecumenical cooperation where we apply our religious insights to the task of promoting integral human development, working for peace, justice and the stewardship of creation. I am certain, Your, your Old Holiness, that your lecture here today will demonstrate just that, and we look forward to hearing you now. On behalf of all the students of St Mary's University, I am delighted to welcome His All Holiness Bartholomew to our beautiful chapel today. It is a real honour and a privilege to host him and I look forward to hearing his address. The title of today's lecture, Religion in Dialogue, the importance and imperative of dialogue in our world could not be more relevant, as a brief look at the news headlines will confirm. What's more, today marks another milestone for St Mary's as we welcome Pope Benedict XVI to this chapel five years ago. St Mary's is proud to play its part in supporting interfaith dialogue. Our academics in the Inspire Centre are world leading thinkers on this subject and our Vice Chancellor Francis Campbell speaks passionately about the role that faith can play in global leadership. This is part of our wider commitment to bringing our ethos of inclusivity, community and reconciliation to the greater good of society. As President of the Students' Union, it is one of my responsibilities to ensure that our campus life is vibrant and supportive of our students so that they are able to achieve their potential. 
Today is further evidence of the opportunity for debate and enlightenment at St. Mary's. We are in a privileged position today of hearing about one of the world's biggest challenges from a leading figure in that debate. I want to thank His All Holiness for sharing his wisdom with us today and for helping to broaden our perspectives. Right Reverend Bishop Richard of Arundel and Brighton, Chair of Governors, and Dr. Francis Campbell, Vice Chancellor of this esteemed university. Distinguished faculty and guests, very beloved students, we gratefully accepted this invaluable honor offered to us by St. Mary's University on the occasion of our formal invitation to London by the Most Reverend Archbishop Justin of Canterbury in order to address you and receive the unique award of the Pope Benedict XVI Medal, the highest honor conferred by your institution for the first time ever. We warmly welcome this privilege as recognition of the sacred ministry of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, an apostolic institution with a history spanning 17 centuries throughout retaining its venerable see in the historic city of Constantinople, today Istanbul. Christianity challenges the concept of the human person as merely an economic entity or consumer. The Christian tradition insists that every human person is an animal called to deification, in Greek, zon theumenon, to adopt the words of St. Gregory the Theologian. We are creatures called to share in God's glory and become partakers of divine nature. The most important fact about our humanness is that we are formed in the image of God. We have the capacity and freedom to offer the world back to God in thanksgiving, and it is only in this act of offering that we become genuinely human and truly free. Of course, freedom is not only personal, but also interpersonal. As human beings, we cannot be genuinely free in isolation. We can only be genuinely free in a community of other free persons and in the context of connection with the natural environment. To refuse to share is to forfeit liberty. This indeed is specifically what is implied by the Christian doctrine of God, according to which we profess that the being of God is a relational being. And if we are formed in the image of the Trinity, it follows that everything said about God also applies to humankind. We are called to reproduce on earth, so far as this is possible, the same movement of reciprocal love that in heaven unites the three persons of the Trinitarian God. Even our social program is the doctrine of a God in communion. Every form of community, the workplace, the school, the city, the nation, has as its vocation to become a living icon of the Trinity. Such is surely part of the role of religion in a changing world namely to promote freedom among human beings as the basis of encounter and communion. The Ecumenical Patriarchate has always been convinced of its wider role and ecumenical responsibility. 
This inspires its tireless efforts for Orthodox unity throughout the world, as well as its pioneering efforts for ecumenical dialogue. Some of the highlights of this dialogue with the Roman Catholic Church include the historic meeting between Ecumenical Patriarch Athenagoras and Pope Paul VI in 1964, which led to the mutual lifting of the anathemas from 1054 and the equally historic visit between the late Pope John Paul II and our predecessor, Ecumenical Patriarch Demetrius, in 1979, just one year after the election of the late Pope, which led to the announcement of the theological dialogue between our two churches, which started a year later, 1920. Uh, 80. The visit of the present Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI to Turkey in 2006 in response to our invitation to attend the thronal feast of the Ecumenical Patriarchate led to a renewal of that commitment to dialogue. Perhaps above all, however, the recurring encounters and exchanges with our beloved brother, Pope Francis, have sig signaled and sealed our obligation and dedication to solidarity in the world, as well as our fidelity to tradition and our responsibility for unity in the Church. Nevertheless, even at the cost of defamation for betraying the gospel, we have never restricted such engagements merely to Christian confessions. Standing as it does on the crossroads of continents, civilizations, and cultures, the Ecumenical Patriarchate has always served as a bridge between Christians Muslims and Jews. Since 1977, it has pioneered a bilateral interreligious dialogue with the Jewish community on such topics as law, tradition, and social justice. Since 1986, it has initiated bilateral interfaith dialogue with the Islamic community on such matters as peace, justice, and pluralism. And since 1994, it has organized a number of international multi-faith gatherings for the purpose of deeper conversations between Christians, Jews, and Muslims on such issues as tolerance. We hear it stated often that our world is in crisis, yet never before in history have human beings had the opportunity to bring so many positive changes to so many people simply through encounter and dialogue. While it may be true that this is a time of crisis, it must equally be underlined that there has also never been greater tolerance for respective traditions, religious preferences, and cultural peculiarities. This does not mean that differences on the level of doctrine are insignificant or inconsequential, for a difference on the level of doctrine leads to a different world view and, accordingly, a different way of life. Accordingly, then, we do not approach dialogue in order to set our arguments against those of our opponents in the framework of conflict. We approach in a spirit of love, sincerity, and honesty. In this respect, dialogue implies equality, which in turn implies humility. 
Honesty and humility dispel hostility and arrogance. But just how prepared are we to love and to learn in dialogue? True dialogue is, in fact, a gift from God. According to St. John Chrysostom, 4th century Archbishop of Constantinople, God is always in personal dialogue with human beings. God always speaks through prophets and apostles, through saints and mystics, even through the natural creation itself. For the heavens declare the glory of God. Iurani the unde doxan theu in the original Greek. Dialogue does not only involve people, it involves the very ground uh, that we tread, the world where we live, and the air that we breathe. As you are aware, dear friends, our ecumenical patriarchate has long taken pioneering initiatives to raise awareness on the vital challenge of creation care. We have repeatedly emphasized that the environment is not only a political or a technological issue. It is, as we have come to appreciate, primarily a religious and spiritual issue. Religion has a key role to play and the spirituality that remains uninvolved with outward creation is ultimately a faith that is uninvolved with the inward mystery too. We firmly and fervently believe that in the struggle to save our planet, everyone without exception, irrespective of confessional or religious conviction must be included and involved. Moreover, since we are addressing you within an academic institution, we would underline that every science and discipline should also concur and contribute. This is because environmental issues are intimately related to cultural and social issues such as war and peace, social justice and human rights, as well as poverty and unemployment. Indeed, a Zohan mystic, Abba Isaac the Syrian, who lived where our world today experiences so much pain and suffering, encourages us to acquire a merciful heart burning with love for all of creation, for humans, birds, and beasts. By some mysterious connection that we do not always understand and sometimes even choose to ignore, the earth reminds us of our calling to embrace dialogue. We will be judged by the tenderness and delicacy with which we respond to nature, which reflects the way we pray to God and treat others. Such is the way of humility, of treading lightly and gently. The earth itself has the humility and resilience to heal us all if we allow it to survive. This is why in all of our ecological activities over the past three decades, we have always insisted, insisted on an interfaith presence and approach. After all, interreligious dialogue should inspire a spirituality of compassion and connectedness. If we had such vision and feeling, we would surely appreciate the importance of sustaining the planet's resources, 
just as caring for the world's poor. We would not be so naive as to claim that dialogue comes without cost or danger. Approaching another person or another belief, another culture, always comes with a risk. One is never certain what to expect. Will the other suspect us? Will the other perceive us as imposing our own belief or way of life? Will we compromise or perhaps lose what belongs uniquely to our own tradition? What is the common ground on which we can converse? What, if any, will be the fruitful results of dialogue? Many questions. These questions will naturally plague us when we approach for dialogue, yet we are convinced that in the moment when one surrenders one's mind and heart to the possibility of dialogue, something sacred happens. In the very willingness to embrace the other, beyond any fear or prejudice, a mystical spark is kindled and the reality of something or someone far greater than us takes over. Then we recognize how the benefits of dialogue far outweigh the risks. We are convinced that in spite of cultural, religious and racial differences, we are closer to one another than we could ever imagine. Dear friends, it is this grace of encounter with other cultures and faiths that we urge you to pursue, for we are deeply and, and unwaveringly convinced that this will bring about the surprise of justice and harmony that our world so urgently desires and demands. May God bless you all, administration, faculty, and students alike, in your journey towards such dialogue with all people and with our planet, our planet. We thank you and God bless you. Your All Holiness, I want to extend my thanks, and on behalf of those present, our thanks and gratitude for these inspirational words. It is an honor and a privilege to welcome you to St. Mary's campus and to hear your perspective on the possibilities of interfaith dialogue. At a time when the world needs all the help it can, to create better dialogue. Your All Holiness's words are a powerful reminder of how faith can provide a common grammar and shared values on which to seek reconciliation. Your All Holiness, you have been a crucial figure in fostering good relations between our two ancient churches. The brave and historic steps taken by Your All Holiness and both the late Pope John Paul II and Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI were significant milestones in the history of Christianity. I am sure I speak for everyone present when I welcome this progress, and we all look forward to continuing on this path towards greater Christian unity. Your All Holiness, 
you have also played a key role in supporting better dialogue between East and West. Your leadership has challenged us all to vigorously pursue solutions to the problems of the modern age. As the divisions between East and West risk becoming increasingly fraught, your moral and spiritual guidance is a true beacon of hope and support to our political leaders. Indeed, today's address has reiterated the role that religion plays in global diplomacy. To ignore religion is to ignore a key motivating factor in contemporary history. Political leaders must begin to see religion as a source of healing and a way to address global problems across races, nations, and tribes. Your All Holiness, I am delighted that St. Mary's is able to contribute in its own way to this debate. As a university, we are determined to reach beyond our own walls and to engage in and promote public debate. The role that faith plays in society is a key focus for us. We are guided by numerous papal encyclicals, which teach us that vocation for good is not just for the individual, but for society as a whole. The Inspire Centre here at St. Mary's, focusing on social justice, sustainability, and both the personal and common good, is one clear demonstration of that ambition. Finally, as Vice-Chancellor of St. Mary's University, I am delighted to award Your All Holiness the St. Mary's Pope Benedict XVI Medal, the first time we have awarded this medal, which is the highest honour that we can bestow. I invite you now, Your All Holiness, to accept this medal as a sign of our gratitude for your presence here today and in recognition of your tireless work in promoting better relations across our world. <laughs>